So it's over to Trevor Davenport, who is going to give us a talk on photographing butterflies and moths. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Jane. Morning, everybody. And we are still just about in morning. I think we've done quite well, really. That was that was fascinating. Some interesting talks there and, uh, and most enjoyable. Thank you indeed for, for asking me to do this little bit, bit on photographing butterflies and moths. Let me share my screen or at least try to. Um, where are we here? That should come up in a short while. Here we are. Now, hopefully, you can all see that and, and not me. Put me over to one side because you don't want to look at me. Yeah, morning, everybody, again. Thank you very much for, for inviting me to do this little talk on photographing butterflies and moths. Although, you know, when I looked at the last newsletter, which I thought was excellent, by the way, a really superb newsletter, and, uh, and we're very fortunate to have such, such, a, such a good lot of information as we got last time. But the, the photographs that I saw there in the competition, particularly the winner by John Cobham, I thought were absolutely outstanding. So I don't need too many people need to be told how to photograph butterflies and moths. But anyway, uh, let's let's see how we get on. This, of course, is a small tortoise shell. Now, it always dings the first time round. Uh, why do we need to photograph butterflies and moths? Well, I think most of us uh, who are interested in, in butterflies and moths and, you know, conservation in general, we, we, we tend to be photographers as well. And there's several reasons why. Uh, this, by the way, is a is, um, common blue on a... Um, a goat's beard plant, it just shows that how small a common blue can be, doesn't it? To, to, to take a record of, of what we've seen, uh, perhaps to, to validate uh, a sighting. We've heard just now uh, that sometimes butterflies and moths can be very rare, particularly in a certain location. And if we've seen one there, if we can get a decent photograph, we can, we can validate that as a record. So that's one reason. Another reason, of course, is personal enjoyment. I love to photograph butterflies and moths for many, many reasons. It gets me out and about and it, it, it gets me interested in, in a subject that I thoroughly enjoy. And if you get a little bit more into it, you can do talks and presentations and, and use your images to illustrate the talk that you're giving. If you really get well developed on it, you can put your images, as John Cobham and some others did, into a competition or into an exhibition. But I think one of the main reasons for me for photographing butterflies and moths, and I have to add insects as well, uh, it's because they're beautiful. And I really do think they are. Uh, a butterfly well photographed is, is a thing of great beauty. Well, how? All right, well, this is a canary shouldered thorn, which uh, I'll talk about the thorns a little bit more. How do you photograph them? Well, I'm sure most of you know how. These days, even the most basic camera can produce stunning photographs if it's used properly. You can buy a camera now for about £40. This is on, um, I, think, I think this is, I Googled this and, and, it, and it's just on, on the web. £40 and this camera will probably take pictures better than you could have taken uh, 20, 25 years ago. I find that quite remarkable. For that amount of money, and, and other compact cameras as well, you can produce really, really good images. But if that's not your cup of tea, what you could do, you could go to one of these. Uh, the latest Canon R5 mirrorless body, which on its own, without a lens, costs 4,300. You might get it a bit cheaper in, uh, on, on Black Friday, but these cameras tend to hold their price. And if you want to photograph good macro, now you're going to have to pay for a macro lens as well, which is the best part of another thousand pounds. So it depends what you want to do, I suppose. And as we heard just now, mobile phones these days, especially the top end ones like this iPhone 13, they can take stunning pictures. You know, back in the days of slides, um, when, when we had film cameras, not digital cameras, you would, you would have been so envious 
to have fast forwarded 25 years or so and see some of the images that, that phones can produce, high resolution images. And now we've got phones that have got wide angle, macro, uh, all kinds of different lenses. And it's quite incredible, the sort of thing that they can produce. So there's a lot of stuff out there that will take a really, really good photograph. And, and then you come involved into the art and the craft of photography. I think, you know, one of the one of the main things, whatever your camera is, whether it's that very basic 40 pounds one or a small compact or, or a bridge camera, even the massive Canon camera that we saw just now, get to know your camera, get to know your camera. When, when I first got involved in photography, which was a long, long time ago now, I went on a couple of courses with a very well known photographer in the Midlands. He's still around. He's known as Mr. Photography. And one of the things he used to say to us, uh, he, was, he was rather uh, brusque at times, he'd say, uh, read your blurb, blurb, blurb handbook, read your handbook. Well, in those days, you know, back in the days of film cameras, your handbook could be quite helpful. But these days with, with digi sophisticated digital cameras, I mean, even the, the most basic have got a lot of functions that we never had in those days. It can be quite intimidating. Here we've got, I've recently gone over to Olympus. I've always been Nikon, but I've just changed over to Olympus because it's light in weight and it does other things that I want to do. But the Olympus camera, the OMD, is extremely complicated. The handbook that they provide with it is, is not very good. So I bought at great expense this Mastering the Olympus OMD. Well, it's got 615 pages in it. And, and they're all closely typed. So, oh my word, it, it's, it's a nightmare. And even if you try to simplify that, you've got the Olympus Mark II menu simplified it. That's got 176 pages. And, and I've got both of these books and, and, and they're by me, they're, they're close in the room. I use them for doorstops now. Uh, and they, they do a good job actually. So Reading books and reading manuals isn't the only way. We're very, very fortunate these days. You can watch YouTube. What a great resource that is. If there's anything you don't know about your camera or anything you want to learn, these, by the way, are three Piotrusic moths all in the school of learning to, to take photographs. You can watch it on YouTube. And, and I think YouTube is, is a wonderful resource, but even better. If you're into photography, and, and, and why not? There's a, a great enjoyment in photography. It's a great idea to join a camera club or a photographic society. And, and, and you will then learn how to develop your photography. So get to know your camera, please. That is probably the most important thing about taking pictures, not just of moths, butterflies and insects, but of other things to get to know your camera, work on it and it pays dividends, it pays massive dividends. So what if you've got all this camera gear, you know, you've just been out and spent 4,300 on the latest Canon uh, R5 with a 1,000 odd macro lens, got all the gear, but no idea. This, by the way, is um, Niobe fritillary, a lovely, lovely a continental moth, a uh, beautiful thing. What about field craft? You know, particularly this applies really more to butterflies, I think, than to moths, excuse me. <coughs> butterflies out in the field. Butterflies can be difficult to photograph. I'm sure we, we all appreciate that. Uh, and field craft is important. I'm just gonna have a drink of water because I've gone croaky. <coughs> yes, field craft is important. So you need to avoid sudden movements. Butterflies, they, they've got good eyes, but their eyesight isn't brilliant, they compound eyes. However, their brain is programmed to detect movement. And sudden movement and butterflies don't go together. So you need to approach stealthily. Wear somber clothing. I once went on a, on a, a trip, an overseas trip, butterflies. <laughs> one of the characters turned up in one of these bright Hawaiian t-shirts and I think he got yellow trousers on and he, he didn't go down very well. But anyway, wear sombre clothing, avoid casting sudden shadows. And that's easy to do. On a sunny day, you, you, you're approaching a, a, a settled butterfly. And if you get your shadow across it, 
invariably it'll fly away. Try not to disturb the vegetation. Now that's even more difficult for me because I like to use a tripod. So I have to be really careful that I don't disturb the vegetation with the legs of my tripod. Keep below the skyline, get down on your belly, become a commando if you have to. And the main thing is to be quiet. Butterflies have ears and you, you, you learn that. You, you learn sometimes, no matter how careful you are, how subtle your approach, when you press that shutter, tiny little noise, if you've got a, a camera that produces beeps, and a lot of people do, you can hear going beep, beep, when they're taking the, the butterfly will fly. So keep quiet. And morning and evenings are the best time to photograph but butterflies, particularly when the insects are cool and settled. How about this for a brilliant photograph? And yes, it's one of mine. I have to confess to it. I only took this about a month ago. I was on the island of Corfu with Corfu Butterfly Conservation. And it, every one of us had, had a camera. Uh, <laughs> and this is a, a great banded grayling. It, it just dropped down and settled. We saw, it, we saw it land. But then what happens, of course, is everybody makes a mad dash towards it. You know, arms outstretched, mobile phones and cameras. And of course it flies away. <coughs> So in order to get a record, I, I put, I've got a long lens on. I've been photographing something with a longer lens. I just took this shot and I know it's wretched. And here's the butterfly, <coughs> you can't see it. it's just in there, great banded grayling. Uh, but at least I got a record. And then of course, when everybody rushed at it, it flew away. Uh, <laughs> but that's what happens. And field craft, sometimes field craft can pay dividends. This particular one, this isn't the, uh, the great banded, this is the Eastern Rock Railing again in Corfu, uh, but it, it illustrates a point. This is sneaking up with, you know, on your elbows like a commando. And this, this particular picture, the rocks in the background were very, very bright. And so in order to get it with that, if, if I'd just used the camera settings, it would have been underexposed because the bright light from the background was telling my camera to, to close down. So I overexposed uh you know maybe three quarters of a stop and i got i got the picture at the right exposure so there are other things that you need to think about when you're photographing and i you know when i was back in the days of, of um, the film cameras when you slides were expensive and you'd only got 24 or 36 of them sometimes only 12. so you had to be careful with your you know your use these days it's wonderful isn't it we've got um with digital you can take as many as you want really but I did this little mnemonic to remind myself of the things that I needed to remember when I was photographing out in the field or or on your backyard in the patio if you want I call it bless five letters is simple to remember bless stands for the background the lighting the exposure the sharpness and finally the subject bless it's easy to remember how do you produce, you know, how can you show what bless means? Well, here we've got a, um, a magpie moth and it is a beautiful moth. And, and these magpies come, I've only ever seen this variety. I know they've got different forms. I'd love to see some more, but produce a background if you can, that's unobtrusive. And there's several ways of doing that. One is if, if the moth is docile and you can gently move it, put it onto a, a plain background. Um, like, like this one, for example, a, a slate or a rock that doesn't interfere or, or whatever, even, even a board, it just depends what, what you want to do with your photographs. Backgrounds are important. You saw that thing with the, um, the great banded grayling, all that grass stems and all the rest of it, it completely spoils the photograph, but the record was important, so I'm going to forgive myself. What about lighting? Lighting's important. Especially if you're photographing butterflies in, in, uh, you know, in, in the middle of the day when you've got bright sunlight and grass is casting shadows and all that kind of thing. You, you're never going to get a really decent picture if you've got a lot of shadows. So lighting is important. Flash. I don't use flash if I can avoid it. Sometimes I have to use flash uh, because you wouldn't get a picture if you didn't, particularly if you're out at night photographing, you know, dusking or something like that. You have to use flash, otherwise you're never going to get a, a picture unless you've got a very powerful torch. This eyed hawk moth, 
from my trap. I photographed this on the patio. Again, you can see I've tried to diffuse the background by uh, using a, 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 the focal length was, was fairly shallow depth of field, but enough to get all the moth in focus. And even though it was dusk, when I took this, I think it was probably eight o'clock at night, something like that. Because I use a tripod, I can, I can allow a very slow shutter speed and still keep things sharp. So lighting is important. Make sure that your subject, if you can, is in good light. And if it isn't, then of course you have to use flash. Exposure. Here we've got one of my favorite butterflies, the black veined white. Uh, again, it, it, it's extinct in, in Britain. It went extinct in the early part of the last century, which is a great shame because it's a beautiful butterfly. And you remember from the newsletter, uh, we had an article from, Pav was it Paolo or Pavlo? Pavlo Zaltowski. And he wrote about seeing these beautiful butterflies, uh, the black veined white, in their millions in Siberia. What a sight that must have been to see. And they are very common on the continent. I've actually seen hordes of black veined whites in, in certain locations. Uh, they are lovely, they're stately butterflies. But when you're photographing white butterflies like this on a, on a fairly white subject, there's a tendency for your camera to want to close down. It thinks it's seeing bright light. You know, it thinks it's photographing in bright light. And so again, you've got to watch your exposure. Now you can do that with almost every camera you've got these days on a histogram. The histogram will show you, I mean, you can take a, a trial shot, look at your histogram and then go back and take another one. If the butter, that butterfly I was photographing was, was just perched there, it, it was quite happy to just sit there. And what you get with your histogram is very important. If you're over here, this, this hump in the middle is perfect. This is the sort of thing you want to get. If you're over here to the right, and you've lost a lot of your histogram to the right, you're going to be overexposed. If you're here in the, the left-hand side of the histogram and you've gone over to the end and beyond it, then your black will all be blocked up. So the idea, the aim, if possible, is to get your image in the middle of your histogram. Now, almost all cameras these days will have histograms, many, many of them, You'll have histograms in color showing you the red, green, and the blue. Um, so so you, can, you can tell what your colors are. Get to know your histograms because they can, they can show you what sort of exposure you're getting. Sharpness. Sharpness is, you know, it, it, it's really important. There's nothing worse than looking at an image of anything really, but particularly of a butterfly or a moth, and it's all fuzzy, sometimes so much that you can't make out what it is. Sharpness it can also stand for stability. I like to use a tripod so that I can be really stable. But with butterflies, <coughs> excuse me, especially in this kind of position, this by the way is a grayling on sea holly taken here in Ainsdale. Uh, I live in Formby, just, just down the road. And in August, these are relatively common here. They're lovely things, but I digress. Sharpness, if you take them with the wings closed like that, uh, and you get the plane of your camera, your sensor right, it will be sharp. What won't be sharp usually is both antennae because you, your camera won't have the ability, if you're trying to soften the background anyway, your camera won't have the ability to get both antennae because they're in a V-shape sharp. These days, fortunately, you can, you can do something about that with something they call photo stacking. But that's another story because that's that's a little bit, it's not difficult, but it's a different aspect of things. And these days with photo stacking, what a blessing it is because you can get everything sharp. It's a wonderful thing. Have a look about photo stacking. And the final thing is, is subject. If you can, particularly for competition photographs, when, you, when you're going to enter, you know, into like our competition or, or butterfly conservation or, or the calendars or whatever, you need to have a good subject. Not good in the fact that it's rare or it's whatever, but it needs to be in good condition. Quite often we photograph butterflies and moths and they're a bit tatty, you know, maybe, maybe been pecked at by a bird or come to some hot, they might just be getting old. So if you get a good subject, a pris this is a small blood vein and they're coming into our, our area a lot more. I'm getting a lot more of these these days small blood vein, but it was in beautiful condition. It was, it was really fresh. 
and I was so pleased to be able to photograph it. So there you are, bless. An easy mnemonic to remember when you're out taking photographs, bless. Yeah, butterflies and moths are not just in the adult stage, are they, the Imago? They also are in many other forms. And I love to photograph caterpillars. I think we've got some stunning caterpillars, you know, some, some really beautiful things. This is the caterpillar of the vapor of moth, which, which is a whole subject in itself, the vapor, you know, the way the male finds the, the female who, who doesn't fly and stuff like that and then lays eggs. But I, I, I raised some vapor caterpillars last year and this year, and oh, it's great fun. But a, a lovely thing with these tussocks and things like that. I love that. And have you ever noticed, this is the caterpillar of the drinker moth, have you ever noticed some of these larger caterpillars, you know, this is almost a bit longer as your finger, uh, this and things like oak egg, when they're disturbed, and this one was aware of me, uh, they, they raise their heads. And I've often wondered if that's to imitate a snake. I mean, they're a bit on the small side to imitate a snake. I don't know why they do it. It's, it's strange behaviour that. Uh, Oak eggers do it and one or two others do it as well. Uh, beautiful things. Elephant hawk moth. Now, I often wondered when, when I first got involved in, in moths and butterflies, why they called them elephant hawk. Well, this is the obvious answer, isn't it? It's a huge caterpillar. And they look a little, little bit like elephant trunks, especially when you look at this end of them. Uh, it looks like an elephant trunk. So I think that's uh, where, where they became elephant hawk moths. <laughs> Wonderful things. And a great fun to raise again as well uh, and to photograph. I love this one. This is a caterpillar with attitude. This is the caterpillar of the puss moth. What a stunning thing it is. And you know, when it, it if it's angry, it, it makes these tails come out and it flicks them around. And if it gets even angrier than that, underneath here, it's got a little gland that can exude uh, formic acid. And I believe it's quite strong. I've never had one do it on me. Um, but they're wonderful caterpillars, aren't they? And, and I think this has probably got to be my favourite, the caterpillar of the pale tussock. You often see these on their perambulations, you know, in the late summer, early autumn, they're going to find a place to pupate uh, and they wander about and, and they're very noticeable because they're this bright yellow. But there are other colour forms. You can get them in a sort of pinky purple and uh, lovely things to see. This caterpillar, I think, is, is the most colourful I think I've ever seen. I photographed this in Bulgaria on its food plant. It's the Spurge hawk moth caterpillar and it's it's startlingly colourful and it knows it is because it doesn't take any notice of anything around it. It knows that if anything wants to try and eat this they're going to get a really bad taste. It's been feeding on Spurge and all that milky sap is inside it. Uh, the adult moth is is pretty dull really. Uh, it hasn't got a lot going for it at all, but the caterpillar is a stunner. Even pupae can be fascinating. This is again the uh, the black veined white and the lovely uh, pupa of, of the black veined white. And sometimes they can be quite strange. We're back to the push moth now. I would love to know if anybody's ever been out in the field and actually found uh, by searching the pupa of the push moth because they're so disguised they chew up wood and at the bottom of some bark and they just they're like this and it I, I have never found one I found push moth caterpillars out in the field but I've certainly not found a pupa this is one that I raised and they produce this peculiar hard um, chrysalis and then of course they'll come out you know sometime in April to produce this truly truly beautiful moth this is the adult. And isn't it a stunning thing? Moths and butterflies, they, they, they really are quite beautiful. Uh, in, in, in fact, insects, in my opinion, could be produced as art. You know, our insects have had a rough time, haven't they, with us over the last, well, 100 and odd years with insecticides and habitat loss. And oh boy, they've had a terrible time. And I think we ought to try and do them justice and, and make them beautiful to show people that exactly what they are insects as art without the lettering without the numbers without the writing look at this this is the, the marbled fritillary another continental butterfly oh, what a beautiful thing it is uh, and and for me they're artistic i'm gonna have a sip of water and we are going to be on time we're doing all that 
back with my black veined whites again. You, that, that they perform for you. They, they'll, when they gather in the evening or in the morning, these lovely butterflies, this is the way they settle. And you don't have to work hard to get your photographs. Just approach them carefully and, and, and away you go. This, this butterfly, as I said to you earlier, was extinct in the early part of the last century. And I believe Winston Churchill, you know, if you Google this, it's, this is true, I'm not making it up. Winston Churchill tried to reintroduce it. I understand he brought a lot of caterpillars from the continent and he, and he put them about his stately home. And it, I mean, that's a naughty thing to do. You wouldn't do that these days. But, you know, he was Winston Churchill. And his gardener apparently chopped all the food plants down and the caterpillars went with them. So it, it was a failure. Uh, it, the conditions are right for this butterfly in the UK now, probably in the south, um, and it would be lovely to see it back because I, I think it's a stunner. So is this scarce swallowtail, beautiful things, lovely things, artist things. You know, artists paint these things, but why shouldn't photographers? And you know, in in Japan and the Far East, the Apollo is revered. Uh, oh, what a stunning thing it is. You know, and it, to me, it's artistic uh, and, and well worthy of, of a good photograph if you can get one. Here at home, we've got butterflies that can look beautiful. You know, we, you tend to think of a small heath as a fairly dull, you know, nice to see, but it's never going to be stunningly beautiful. I think it is. And if you go out late at night, well, in the summertime, you know, talking about seven, eight o'clock, nine o'clock even. Sometimes you can find them at roost and certainly in the morning. And if you're lucky, you might have some dew on them as well. And that adds a little bit of drama to the photograph. Stunning things, moths too, beautiful, truly beautiful, lime hawk moth. And, and these, these larger hawk moths, if you're very careful with them, leave them in the trap until the evening and they're docile, they'll go to sleep and just very gently uh, move them to a perch uh, and, and they can make really, really beautiful photographs. Not all, I mean, a lot of moths won't do that. Some of the moths, well, forget it. They're, a lot of the carpet moths, almost impossible to photograph. And, and, and to a degree, I, I don't bother because uh, I don't want to disturb them too much. But you find with a lot of these larger moths, they're quite amenable. Here's our lovely vapor. This is the male with this huge antennae resting on a fence in my garden. And, you know, not too concerned as long as I approach him carefully. The thorn moths, my favourites, really. I love the thorn moths. They, 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 they perch like butterflies, or some of them do, uh, some with their wings hardly open. Uh, I wondered when I first got involved in mothing, why they call them thorn moths. And I thought it might be because of this marking, you know, that some of them have got, but it isn't. The caterpillars uh, have got like thorn-like projections coming from them. But aren't they stunning things, you know? I know all you guys are converts, but most people don't realize that we, we've probably got about 750 macro moths in this country alone. And many of them are just incredibly beautiful, stunningly beautiful. The winter moth, appropriate for the time that we're in now. Uh, the male, of course, the female doesn't flush his winglets. But look at him. This is the December moth. And, and he, look at his body, got his fur coat on. And, and you find that with early moths as well. You know, the moths we see in, in February and March, they've got uh, lots of lovely protective fur or whatever you want to call it, for obvious reasons to protect them from the cold, but beautiful, stunningly beautiful. And you know, all insect, in my opinion, can be beautiful. Let's just deviate a little bit from butterflies and moths and look at some of the things that we get here, um, here on the Sefton coast, the red banded sand wasp, quite common to see that they, they nectar on thistles in the, in the spring and flies you wouldn't think flies could be beautiful but i think they are this is this was taken here in in, uh, in just just south of formby we've got a, a patch of apple mint and it's a great place in uh, in august and early september to, to photograph butterflies and all kinds of things this is a tachinid this is tachina fera and and even though it's beautiful, it's a bit naughty because it, it lays its eggs on caterpillars, particularly moth caterpillars, and, and of course they, they get eaten, but we'll forgive it for that because it's beautiful. And if you can, it's always nice to get a pair. Sometimes when you get a pair, they 
the, the more friendly flies fly away. You've got to be really, really careful to get close to those. But when they're doing something, particularly when they're doing this, they don't seem to bother quite as much. Other things are beautiful too. A lot of our insects, this is a banded demoiselle. I love to photograph demoiselles uh, and damoiselle, uh, I'll get it right in a minute, uh, dragonflies, uh, adults, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the stunningly beautiful species of insect, the banded <coughs> demoiselle on convolvulus. So there we are, we've come almost to the end, uh, back with my lovely Niobe fritillary, uh, which I photographed in Bulgaria. And it's time, I think, for uh, something close to home. This, this is, you wouldn't believe that these moths are here, right where I live in Formby. I've only got to go over to the common uh, with um, either a female or with a pheromone. And before you know it, I've got half a dozen males flying around me. This is the male of the emperor moth. Isn't it a stunningly beautiful thing? Uh, close to home, we don't have to go to the continent photograph beautiful things they are here where we live so there's my 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 um jiminy cricket pinocchio's philosopher or his guide and, and what he's doing is just telling us to remember background lighting exposure stillness and subject uh to improve your photographs i think i've finished almost exactly on time jane thank you very much indeed Thank you very much, Trevor. That was amazing. Absolutely oh, stunning photographs. Great talk, really informative. Um, I let can't me, thank you enough. Let me come back here. Stop sharing. OK, I'm back with you now. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. Thanks, everybody. Um, if you've any questions, um, please do unmute yourself and um, Fire away. Anybody got any comments? Yeah, that, that was brilliant. As always, fantastic photographs. But were they, nearly all, were they all taken with a macro lens? Because what impresses me so much is your background is so uniform. Was it an artificial background in some cases? Um, let me think. First of all, answer your first question. Yes, they were all taken with a macro lens. Right. Uh, I have two macro lenses. If I some of them were taken with my Nikon equipment, which I'm, I'm finding quite heavy now, but that was with a 200 millimeter macro lens. Right. And, and the fact that it's got that 200 millimeter reach means that it does tend to blur the background. You <laughs> haven't got much depth of field with that particular lens. Mm. And so when I use that, and some of the butterflies were photographed with that lens, it does tend to throw the background yeah. out of focus, which, which is nice, it's which is a, feature, it's a feature I like. I'm now using an Olympus um, macro lens. It's 60 millimeters, but on the sensor, it's the equivalent, the 35 millimeter equivalent of 120, which again is a fairly long macro yeah. lens. And that too tends to throw the background out of focus. However, in order to fully answer your question, um, with the Olympus, I can do photo stacking in camera. And I think you probably can with your Olympus too. My little one, and, yes, I can. Yeah. And so what I can do, I can use a very, um, a, an open, you know, f 5.6 or something like that. And, and that too, it'll photograph the, the, the object, but it won't photograph the background. And I do occasionally, if I'm photographing on the patio, like one or two of the hawk moths, then I, I will, if, if I need to, I'll use an artificial background. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll put a, a painting up or a, or a blank shield behind just to get that blank background. Yeah. yeah. Good. Absolutely brilliant. <coughs> Keep trying right. harder. <laughs> <laughs> no, you do very well. You do very well. Right. I like your photographs. Thank you. That's great. Okay, anybody else? <clears throat> okay, well, um, on that note, um, given we are 12.31, I think we've um, all done amazingly well to um, keep exactly to schedule. So well done, everybody. Um, thank you to all three of our speakers. Um, you've really made the morning. It's been wonderful. Um, so thank you very much for your time and um, producing such great talks for us. Really appreciated.